Well, after a slow introduction, we are finally given a deeper look at Mad Sweeney in one of the show's best entries yet. Hey guys, coming from American Gods, Season 1, Episode 7, A Prayer for Mad Sweeney, and I was definitely looking forward to this episode, just from the title in general. Uh, out of all the characters, one of my favorites by far has been Sweeney. I think he's just such a fun, charismatic character, and I love his dynamic with Laura. Uh, their dynamic has become one of my favorites of the show. It might be my favorite after this episode, um, but like I said, I was definitely really looking forward to this one, and... Just like the Laura-centric episode we got a few weeks ago, this was one of the most insightful episodes we got. I mean, we really got a deeper look into who Sweeney is, why he is the way he is, why he has this connection to Laura, and it was a really great story. I've said it before, American Gods does an incredible job uh, with telling stories like they do in this episode, and uh, essentially, most of this episode uh, was one of those extended sort of prologues, and I thought it was extremely well done here. I really did love what we got out of this episode, but let's just get into it, um, because I really do want to talk about it. And we start off in 1721, basically. We see Anubis puts on a record, and he works on a corpse, and uh, Ibis then brings him some beer, and Anubis tells him that they have more corpses coming. He informs Ibis that he has a story to tell, and uh, we finally get, like, a deeper look at Ibis. Like, we've seen Ibis every episode, but this is probably the most we've seen Ibis throughout any episode. He goes to his study, and he looks at a map of Ireland, and he then begins writing in his book of 1721. The phone rings, Anubis picks it up, and Ibis then it continues. So... Basically, he talks about how prisoners are sold to captains going to America, and the prisoners are then sold to work in the field, and after their indenture, they make the best of the new world. So, we then get this story of this girl named Essie McGowan, and Essie McGowan is actually also played by Emily Browning, which honestly was a very clever move, already knowing the relationship that Sweeney and Laura have. I thought it was a smart idea to have, you know, another character over Sweeney in Iraq with that's kind of like Laura, so... She slips off to listen to tales of the fairies and the leprechauns, and uh, she doesn't really think much of it. You know, she thinks, uh, she goes to the shore, she waits for her father's ship to come in, and the mistress of the house then points out a nearby hill and says that it's portal to, it's a portal to fairy, and Essie might actually catch a glimpse of them. So she says the leprechauns are mischievous, but they leave them gifts to get their blessings. So, yeah, in this world, they do, in fact, believe the fairies and leprechauns, because they are very real, and uh, she believes that leprechauns, you know, while mischievous, are in fact good natured and do in fact want to help her. And uh, we'll get into that. But Essie then grows up, she sets out milk for the fairy folk, and she passes on their stories to the children, sort of like what Ibis does. She tells the stories constantly and she kind of passes it down, you know. This is kind of how things were back then. You would pass on this myth and then someone else would tell it. That's why we have so many myths nowadays because most of them were just stories that the common folk told the children either to scare them, teach them a lesson. That's kind of what Essie's doing here. So she glances over at the accountant Bartholomew and afterwards she takes some bread. She walks out into the night to place the bread for the fairy and she ties it with a string. She puts out this gold coin atop of it and a leprechaun Sweeney is then watching her. So we know very well that Sweeney is somehow tied to this story. We just don't know how exactly yet, you know, why is he tied to this story, what's really going on there, um, but like I said, I thought this was just a really well done introduction, one of the things I really did love about the beginning of this episode, and most of this, you know, flat, um, portion in, in, in the, uh, 1700s, is that it is narrated by Ibis. It very much did feel like someone was telling a story to you, rather than we're seeing events played out. It's not, it's done in a way I haven't really seen something like this done before, and that's something I think that American Gods does very well. Sure, we've seen, you know, go into the past a lot of times, but not quite in the way it's done here, and that's something that makes this show so unique. So back at the house, Essie then puts out milk, and Bartholomew comes to her. They make love, and afterward, Essie figures that Bartholomew is just going to go to Oxford and forget her, which honestly was very common back then, that guys would just kind of forget girls and that. they just kind of smash and dash, you know? That's just, I mean, still kind of how it is today in many ways, but that's what she thinks Bartholomew is going to do. So 
Bartholomew gives Essie a necklace that was a present from his grandfather to his grandmother, and he promises to marry her when he returns, and he wants to keep that promise. Like, I will make sure that we get married after I return. So, Avis then says that intelligence has never been uncommon among women, and beauty is had by all of Seventeen, but Essie possessed a rare token of ambition. She was just very ambitious, and Bartholomew's mother, who's actually the mistress of the house, she sees it and she accuses Essie of stealing it. She thinks that she stole this, and Bartholomew claims that he didn't, and the men then take Essie to court. The judge sends her to seven years of transportation on the Neptune owned by Captain Clark, and despite her hunger, Essie always leaves a crumb for the leprechauns, because she knows that the leprechauns, again, are good-natured, and she's been known, you know, she knows that the leprechauns, yes, they are very mischievous, but they are good-natured, she feels like this is gonna help her, uh, in the end. So, eventually, she does, in fact, seduce Clark, and she convinces him to take her to London, where no man knows her. No man knows about, you know, what she's done, so... She does decide to marry Clark. They return to London. They marry, and Clark then opens his home to his new bride. The Neptune repairs to sail eight months later, and Clark promises Essie that he return as soon as he can. And once he leaves, she steals everything that she can. And I'm talking like everything. You know, she steals like uh, valuable materials, bread, anything that she possibly can. She just steals and. She puts out milk for the leprechauns, and again, that's a big part. She's always thinking of the leprechauns, and again, I thought this was a really great introduction to the story. Uh, but then we finally go back to the present, which I didn't think we were going to get in this episode. I didn't think we'd get any of the present here, but actually we do. But the clever thing is that it is only uh, the Laura and uh, Sweeney subplot, which I thought was smart here. I thought it really didn't make a lot of sense to do that as a parallel to what they did with Essie and uh, Sweeney, and I thought it was honestly kind of smart that they never exactly reveal, does Laura have a connection to Essie, or does, you know, Sweeney just see a lot of her? I'll talk about that at the end, because a lot of people have been talking about that, but Samil then continues hit driving his cab, and Laura then sees Shadow's light behind, and they stop at a ranch of Derek Arnold Jr., where this white buffalo is believed sacred to the local Indians that, uh, that was born, and Salim then prays, and he invites Laura to join him, and she turns him down and asks if he loves God, and he says that he does love his God, but as we know, God's never really been on Laura's side, so there's a big reason why she doesn't really have a God to pray to, because he has never really been on her side until she died, and uh, for that, she doesn't feel like she needs to pray to him. So, meanwhile, Sweeney is pissing in a nearby forest, a crow then, craw then calls up at him, and addressing the crow, Sweeney says that he's on his way to Wisconsin at the House of the Rock per the arrangement, and he tells the crow to tell Wednesday to fuck himself, and as he turns back, he finds Laura there. She suggests that they just let Salim go. That Salim, you know, he has his own story to tell, and he's better off without them. But Sweeney refuses, saying that he has business after her business, because, you know, that's not all Sweeney's there to do. Sweeney's there to advocate to other people, and she tells Salim what Sweeney said, that they will all be at House of the Rock, and that he's released from his bargain. And Salim then tells Sweeney that he's an unpleasant creature. He gets in his cab and drives off to find the djinn. Obviously, we know the djinn is who he feels is going to solve all his problems, and Furious Sweeney then kicks across a picnic table. Laura then goes over to this ice cream truck and tells the vendor that she's going to steal his truck. She gives the vendor all the money she has, tells him to tell his boss that the truck was stolen, and he just basically agrees, because, I mean, she outright threatens him. So Sweeney, and Sweeney then cheerfully punches the vendor to make the theft look convincing, and he and Laura then drive off, and that was awesome. I love that they just literally knocked this guy out. They didn't give a shit about him at all, and, uh, yeah, so they go out on their ice cream truck, and that's sort of what we see in the present. So, back in the past, Etsy then becomes in a accomplished shoplifter like this is something she does a lot she lives by her labors with the thanks of no men she never forgets to leave gifts out for the leprechauns and a man then sees her and they soon go home and they make love and slowly essie forgets to leave the gifts and this is obviously something that she's been told to do since she was a kid you know it starts to become less of a uh you know it, it starts to become less of something that's you know very imperative and something that's just a little bit more like oh sometimes i'll do it and her luck then runs out, and she's actually caught. Remember, the leprechauns give you good luck by giving out those gifts. You know, they give you good luck. And because she forgets, she's finally caught. She's taken to Newgate Prison to be hanged. And when she's given food, 
Sweeney is in the next cell and basically advised her to only eat the bread. Don't eat anything else. Just eat the bread. And he says that he doesn't belong there. And someone cut in front of him and he fought. The man lost his eye and Sweeney ended up in prison. And this scene between Sweeney and Essie, I thought was really well done. You can see why Sweeney does have a lot of contempt for her throughout the episode. And Essie then puts some of the bread on the windowsill. She says she went to the Carolinas, but she didn't stay long and... Sweeney says that he had quite a bit of gold, but unfortunately he didn't keep it. He wished he did, but he didn't, and he claims that he delivered it to the king, and Essie tells Sweeney a tale about her time in America and how she met a woman who changed her name to become a new person, and she says that she'd be content to be content, basically. You know, that's, that's the only reason why. She was just content, and she tells Sweeney that in America he could deliver gold to their king, and... She wakes up the next morning, and the bread's gone, and she calls to Sweeney, but gets no answer, and hears someone approaching, so it seems that Sweeney's just gone, she doesn't know exactly what happened, maybe he went to the person that Essie was talking about, but he's gone, and, uh, the warden then brings her good food and says that he made it himself for her, and he tells Essie it'll be 12 weeks until Essie sentences her, so that she's very pretty, and that there was a way that she might escape the gallows, and she's soon pregnant, her sense of death is commuted to trans transportation for life, and around her, men die, and their bodies are thrown overboard, and that's just kind of how it is, so she arrives in Norfolk, which, uh, I was just in a couple months ago, I'm not gonna lie, when I went to Virginia in April, I actually had been to Norfolk, it's a nice town, but <laughs> that's beside the point, obviously, um, but to, anyway, tobacco farmer John Richardson, he needs a wet nurse uh, since his wife actually has died. And busy Essie, she gives birth and she raises both children, telling them her tales like they did, like she did to those children uh, so many years ago. So that's kind of the story that we get here. Uh, but back in the present, we see as she drives, Laura's turning up the air conditioning to preserve her body. He eats a popsicle and tells Laura that she'll be able to, to eat soon enough once she's resurrected. Because remember, she can't balance uh, a diet because... Because, you know, she's not fully um, born, you know, she's not fully resurrected yet. There's a lot of parts of her that are just kind of sewn on, and obviously it's not safe. You know, she can't process food. So, he tosses some coins out, and when Laura asks how much time he has, Sweeney says that he was a king once. And that they made, then they made him a bird, and Mother Church turned them into saints and fairies. And Laura wonders what Wednesday is presenting at the God Fest. And Sweeney says that it's simply war. I mean, we've known from the beginning that Wednesday, I'm sorry, Odin is the god of war. And he went to war once a long time ago, and he saw his death in the campfire on the Eye of Battle. Now... I don't know if they're saying that that war scene we saw in the beginning of the show, the very first scene Sweeney was involved in, but I kind of feel like that's true. I mean, if there's been wars between gods before, then why wouldn't that be one of them? Why wouldn't Sweeney be involved in that? And Sweeney knew that he would die if he stayed, so he deserted, and he tells Laura that he owes a battle, and Laura admits he's done far worse than run Wednesday's heirs. There's a lot more things he's done, and a white rabbit then runs ahead of the truck, Laura swerves to avoid it, but the truck actually crashes, and Laura flies out the windshield. It rips open her chest. I mean, it's just disgusting, but literally, she flies out, and Sweeney's coin then falls out of her body, rolls down the road, and Sweeney has this very, um, he has a choice here. Like, he could either be selfish and just take the coin for himself, which you can tell he wants to do, or he can give back to her. And the way that they left on this intriguing scene, I thought was really well done, and perfectly does, um get us interested in, you know, which Sweeney, you know, what road Sweeney is really going to take, or is he going to take the selfish one, or is he going to try to actually be, um, you know, actually adhere to her? What's he going to do here? So Essie is then telling the children her stories, and John returns home, and she sets the table, prepares to leave. John strokes her face, and Essie and Mrs. She does, in fact, have feelings for him, and they're very strong, and feelings that John can't possibly return, unfortunately. He proposes to Essie on the spot to end her indenture, because why shouldn't he? They're soon married, they have a child, and Essie continues to give the children salt and bread to keep them safe. Remember, going by what Sweeney said, only eat the bread, only eat the salt, and they always are, because of what uh, Sweeney said to her. And John eventually dies 10 years later after Essie hears a banshee in the night, which was crazy. You know, I don't know if John was eaten by a banshee, but that's kind of what we're led to believe, that he was attacked by a banshee or whatever. But Essie, the manager of the plantation, she continues leaving out bread for the fairy, and the farm then flourishes, and 
Essie actually has grandchildren, we see, and uh, she tells them her stories as well, because again, this is what she does. She wants to pass them on to whoever, and she terrifies one grandchild. Essie soon realizes that there's no room uh, for the spirits. You know, they just, they, they can't believe in them anymore. It's just, it's, there's no room for them, and they've done everything they need to, but keep them in her heart to warm her, and because of her always believing in those spirits and the leprechauns, one night Sweeney comes to her, calls her by name as she quickly does die, and it's a very similar scene to what we got with Anubis. Sweeney was her god. Sweeney was the one who saved her. And by knowing this, I think that's kind of why Sweeney makes the decision that he does at the end of this episode, which I'm going to get into, but that's the end of Essie's story. Really well done, honestly. I really do love the story between Essie and Sweeney, and it shows why Sweeney um, is so involved with Laura. I think he does see a lot of Essie in Laura, and I think that's very much what's going on there, but Sweeney wakes up, he crawls out of the wreckage, and he finds Laura's corpse, and he sees his coin nearby, and he picks it up, and he starts to walk away, and what might be my favorite scene with Sweeney, it seems like, you know, he finally got this coin, he's gotten everything he's won, what's the one thing he's won from Laura, you know, since he's met her, just give me the coin, dead wife, that's all he said, give me the coin, give me the coin, you know, you don't, you don't deserve it, this doesn't belong to you, it belongs to me, for some reason, though, even though he does have that coin, he feels that it's selfish, and he actually stops. And the night of the crash, we see Laura lies. She's dying on the side of the road. Sweeney looks at her, and we find out that there's a watching crow to tell Wednesday that is done, and the crow then flies off. So Sweeney saw her when she died, we find out. Uh, like, he was there to see her die. And Furious, he curses an Irish, and he puts the coin onto Laura's chest. He actually puts the coin back inside of her. And she comes back to life, and immediately punches and we realize the coin's the only thing keeping her alive and Laura then puts on a jacket to cover her gaping chest wound. She turns the truck back on its wheels, then tells Sweeney to come on and after a moment he gets in, they drive off and uh, even though he didn't get what he wanted, um, essentially that's what happened. But we see Sweeney, he tells Essie that she might know him. He says that he's there in the new world where no one puts out gifts for the fairy except for her. Essie then realizes who he is, and Sweeney assures her that he has no quarrel with her. It was Essie and a few like her that brought him into a world with no time like people like him. He says that they've done her good and ill, and uh, again, you know, she's done their good, and he flips his coin to the air, catches it, makes it disappear. He asks if Essie will take her hand, and she does, and, uh, you know, she takes his hand, and Ibis then writes that Essie's body was still warm when they found her, because of the fact that she did have those contempt, uh, for the fairies and for the leprechauns. He finishes his writing and closes his book, and as the book closes, that is how this episode comes to an end. But let's just get this episode and where this is going to take us into the finale. Wow, I mean, what a different kind of episode this was. I mean, yeah, like I said, I figured the most episode would focus on Sweeney's past, but not quite in the way it was done. Because while this was focused on Sweeney's past, our main character here wasn't Sweeney. It was either Essie or Laura. And a lot of people have been wondering, you know, does Essie have some sort of connection to Laura? Um, familiarity, no. I, I don't think she does. I don't think there's any sort of familiar connection there. I think that's just a coincidence, that they happen to look the same. But... I do think that because of how Laura looks and because of how Essie looks, I do think that Sweeney sees a lot of Essie's traits in Laura. Even though Laura is not at all like Essie, you know, she's not someone who is very giving. She's not someone who's very understanding. She's not someone who believes in these gods and all that kind of stuff. You know, she's that's not who she is at all. I do still think he sees some of those traits in her, despite the fact that she doesn't really have any of those traits, he, for some reason, sees that in her. And again, I think it's because of the fact that there is a lot of things similar to that of Essie. The fact that she does, in fact, believe in these gods, uh, that she does actually, you know, go on this road trip and things like that. I think there definitely is a part of it that he sees in Essie, and especially the fact he put the coin back inside of her, which, again, I think might be the single most selfless thing we've seen him do yet, and might be my favorite moment for Sweeney. I mean, he had the coin. Think about it. He had that coin. Everything he wanted, he had it, and for some reason, despite the fact he had the coin... 
He knew it wasn't right. He knew that he was not the one who needed this coin. She needed the coin. She needed the coin to survive. That's why he put it back inside her. And, I mean, it's it's got to be the single most selfless thing that Sweeney's done. This very well does show that Sweeney's not a bad guy. Sweeney is someone who I think is good-natured, and he is, in fact, someone that's good. Laura's kind of the selfish one. I mean, she very much is, and... Can you blame her? I mean, you can understand why she's so selfish, you know, selfish, because no one has really uh, helped her throughout her life. You know, you can totally understand that. Um, you know, she hasn't really had anything that great, and, you know, she's longing to, you know, uh, stay in this world and make sure that she does get that fulfillment that she's always wanted. You can understand that. But I think Sweeney does feel a lot of contempt for her because of all that. And I think it's interesting to see where that's exactly going to go. Obviously, like I said, Sweeney cares for her. And I'm looking forward to seeing what happens now. Because, I, I like I said, I do think he does see a lot of Essie in um, Laura. Uh, let's talk about Selene, though. Because Laura is convinced they should just let Selene go. But Sweeney knows he has a greater purpose. And I do think that he does have a greater purpose than just finding this coin. There's clearly more to it than that. What is his purpose involving Selim? I mean, we know that, you know, basically if you believe in leprechauns, then you're going to have good luck and things like that. But because of what Laura is doing, she's not having his good luck. Um, so I think another part of it is that Sweeney wanted to have that good luck. And by keeping that coin inside of her, she will have that good luck. And he wants to be able to live and he wants to be able to be resurrected. Um, but what's gonna happen to Sweeney now? I mean, obviously, Sweeney's purpose is to have that coin, and he doesn't really have his magic or anything. You know, he's basically not human, but he doesn't really, he can't really do what he usually does, and... Again, it's a very selfish, uh, selfless thing that Sweeney really did do. And I don't really know what he's going to do for Salim, but it's going to be very interesting to see where all that goes. Overall, guys, I definitely really did enjoy this episode. Just the style of it all, the way it was told, uh, Ibis' style and everything I thought was extremely well done. I could see someone saying, oh, this was style over substance, didn't really need to be done this way, but I thought it really did keep things interesting, honestly. Uh, you know, other shows would just do the typical flashback episode, but honestly, if we had an entire episode of just Essie, I don't think it would have been as impactful, you know, without getting that scene of him putting the coin back inside of Lore. I think that really did add to uh, the overall emotional resonance of, that was going on in this episode. But overall, guys, I definitely really enjoyed this episode. This is definitely one of the best episodes so far. And I'm definitely going to give American Gods Season 1, Episode 7, A Prayer for Mad Sweeney, a 4.75 out of 5 or an A. So overall, guys, we only have one episode left, which is insane. I can't believe that there's only one episode left of the show. The season has gone by so fast, uh, but I am so interested in seeing where we're going to go in tomorrow night's finale. I think it's going to be, not tomorrow night, I, I think it's, I, I feel like it's Saturday, but it's Friday. I mean, uh, Sunday's finale. I can't wait to see the way that all does play out. But let me know what you guys thought of this episode, up your thoughts, and I really did enjoy this episode overall. Some really great stuff going on here. That's in my review. Hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll see you guys in my next video, which will be for Twin Peaks The Return, and we'll see you guys for that. Okay, bye.